good. Thumbs up. Okay. Okay, so I'm now talking on behalf of my day job, which I also get to use open source in, which is really cool. So uh, I work for, uh, actually, uh, first of all, this is actually a photo of our chip, one of the, the chips that we've done. So um, it will become more apparent on the next uh, slide, which I'll go to. But I work for a company called Morse Micro, and we are um, a fabulous radio chip company. So it, Sorry, my name is Julius, because my name isn't even on the on the thing. Julius Baxter. So, yeah, I'm working for Morse Micro now in Sydney, and we're doing mixed signal uh, Wi-Fi chips. AH, if you don't know, is like a it's a like a low power sub gigahertz variant of wi of Wi-Fi that's been around for a while, um, but it hasn't been commercialised yet. So we're we're working on that. Uh, we're a pretty small company at the moment. We're 20 people, three years old. Uh, I am a digital design engineer. I'm, I do kind of like digital top level and I do the CPU stuff for the chip. Uh, but I've, I've been involved in open source in uh, various sorts of forms over the last 10 years. And now I, yeah, I work for the Fossey Foundation as a volunteer. And um, yeah, I organize these things, which is kind of fun. Okay, so uh, we're using Rocket. So we have essentially, a, if, you know, if you ever do a, a wireless chip, you basically will have a bunch of hardware accelerators, but you're going to want to sequence them and manage the data flow. So a very good way of doing that is having a bunch of little accelerator blocks and having uh, software to sequence it. So, you know, control what's, what's doing what, when. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a very good time to be in the market for a, <laughs> for a bunch of small uh, risk CPUs. Uh, just from my experience, you know, working with the Open Risk Project 10 years ago, I mean, there was a very small number of people who were actually, you know, concentrating on that one project. And there were very few, uh, I guess, other projects that, that had a lot of momentum behind them. I think there was, there were a couple of uh, Spark cores getting around that were of like the deeply embedded class. Uh, the LM32, of course, uh, was, was an option too, but I think the open risk sort of had most of the, the open source community's uh, efforts going into it. Uh, but then risk five happened and we got all these like very talented Berkeley guys contributing to what has become a really impressive uh, uh, ecosystem around risk five. So I think you would be kind of crazy these days to not use risk five for open source uh, architecture and, and the various implementations that there are. And actually, Risk Five basically is what we were planning to do for the next step for the Open Risk project. I remember there's, there still might be a, a wiki page somewhere uh, for the Open Risk 2000 architecture, which was yeah. I mean, the, the Risk Five architecture, obviously, you know, um, David Patterson uh, is is part of that group, and they learned from the mistakes that they'd made over the last 30 years, right? So uh, they they fixed a lot of things, and Open Risk obviously is Open Risk came from MIPS One. And I'm, I'm kind of going down a rat hole here, but Open Risk was was based on the MIPS one architecture, so obviously it had a lot of the the baggage from you know doing a, a risk architecture first time, and learned learned a lot of things from that. So it's all fixed in Risk five. It, it's it's really really cool, and it's it's great to you know collaborate with these guys and and use their IP. So uh, on a little side note, yeah, it's for free free uh, deeply embedded cores. They're of an incredible standard these days. Uh, and I'm, um, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised they're not more worried, or well, maybe they are. Uh, three years ago, so I didn't make the choice, but three years ago there was two kind of major risk five deeply embedded core projects going around. There was Pulp from the ETH crew and Rocket. So I think at the time Rocket's development was, was more, it seemed more kind of active. Uh, the Berkeley guys were constantly pushing to their GitHub uh, and the pulp guys, you know, they do a lot of great work. But I think at the time they were sort of doing big dumps sort of over the wall into a public repo and keeping a lot of the development internal. And to the guys at Morse at the time, they thought, well, we'd prefer to go with the one that looks like it's still continually actively maintained because, you know, who knows when those big dumps are going to stop. Um, so we're using Rocket. And obviously there's, there's a few. There's a few things when you're using an open source uh, ISA, right? Like 
you, you don't know what you're in for. You know, this isn't a commercial product uh, that, that you pay for. It's just, you know, at the time, I think a bunch of graduate students developing a bit of IP. Um, but actually, I think Sci-Fi, yeah, was around then, and they were doing chips. Um, I think our design is based on the very first Freedom uh, bit of IP that was released. So they turned that into, into a real chip. Presumably it worked. I don't think we have actually got any Freedom <laughs> chips and played with them, but you know, it worked in simulation and on FPGA. Uh, and so it seemed like a pretty good bet. Also, the RISC-V spec was moving around, but it was really more the, the privilege, <laughs> privilege spec and all of the, you know, the higher level stuff, and we were just in the market for deeply embedded cores, so um, that was fine. But really, I think, because we're all digital design engineers, we know Verilog, uh, and haven't really been playing with any, well, myself, uh, we haven't really been, oh, that's my colleague, by the way, AL, in, in the audience there. Um, we, we're used to Verilog, like not, not high level languages, and so to all of a sudden be dealing with Chisel uh, was, was something new, and That'll be a bit of a running theme through this talk. I think the IP is fantastic, but we we still struggle a bit with Chisel. But there's definitely some good uh, and, and some bad that comes with that. Um, so yeah, it was a bit of a gamble, but uh, I'll talk about what we did to customize the rocket. So I think most of the rocket chips were planning on having Chisel as the top level, right? So doing all your pin muxing, all of your power control, all of that stuff. Uh, we obviously, I don't know, are not chisel experts, didn't feel confident enough to have the top level of the chip in chisel. So we obviously have a, a very long top level, but that means you have to modify quite a bit of stuff, I think, in, in the rocket for that to make sense. Um, so for instance, uh, what, what's really nice and what I'll talk about a little bit, or what I'll mention later is we have all of our digital register infrastructure um, done with chisel registers, and that's fantastic for a number of reasons, but when you're talking to a bit of analog IP, you need to punch all of these IOs through the top level, so we have a, you know, that's not too hard to do, but it's just something you need to do. Um, and then also exposing uh, buses, so we want to master things outside of the, the, the rocket, but we also want to be able to master the bus um, from other uh, masters outside of the rocket, so we had to add bus ports and um, you, you need to figure out how to use diplomacy to do that, to get that all set up right. Um, it's not too hard once you figure it out, but yeah, again, when you're coming from basically a, <laughs> a background of zero knowledge of, of how to write the language that you're dealing with, you know conceptually what you want to do, but you don't really know how to do it in the language, and that's, it can be frustrating, a lot of trial and error, but you know, you get there in the end. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a bunch of uh, infrastructure in Rocket which we've removed because we didn't need it in the, at the chisel level. We've kind of re-implemented it at the Verilog level, but uh, things like the watchdog timer, for instance, isn't in there because that was integrated into the PMU or the always on block, and we've removed that, so kind of our fault, but uh, that's unfortunate. And yeah, the ins uh, there were a lot of people who were asking about the Rocket uh, like memory subsystem, right? So by default on Rocket, you've got an instruction and a data cache. And for a deeply embedded solution, you might just want like a tightly coupled memory. So uh, for the data memory, you can turn it into, I think like a DTIM, which basically basically acts as a, a little, um, what do you say, like, a, like a, a tightly coupled memory for the data. And for the instruction memory, you could lock the caches, but it's kind of inefficient to do that. And it's also not configurable. So what we wanted was just a bunch of RAM that we could assign to uh, whatever processor we wanted. And so we, I've written that in Verilog and just kind of hacked the instruction fetch bus um, or exposed that to the very top level of the chisel. So that's how we did that. It's probably not very elegant, but it does the job for now. Um, and then oh, we discovered a couple of small things that we needed to tweak for performance in the system. Uh, I think, yeah, the, sorry, if you're not, I probably should have put a block diagram in here if you're not familiar with the rocket architecture, but basically all the cores all of the CPUs talk to this thing called the system bus, and then hanging off that is, is the P bus, which uh, all the peripherals are attached to. And that's a bit of a bottleneck from the S bus to the P bus. So we found out that, uh, for instance, when you're running from serial flash, and there's a, when we still had caches in there, there would be a cache miss. 
And Tile Link is a great uh, transactional bus, but uh, and, and, and so it supports, you know, like bursts, so multiple uh, response, multiple data token like response requests. So you would say, I want 64 bytes, and it would give you like, you know, eight eight byte chunks in return or whatever. Um, but if that goes over the the P bus from the S bus, the entire that uh, interface is locked until that entire transaction is complete. So if you were doing a cache fetch from a serial flash, you would have to wait for the entire, um, you know, serial 64 bytes to get back to whatever cache was requesting it before that gets unlocked. And in the meantime, no other uh, processor can access the peripherals. So little things like that, but that's easily solved by just moving uh, the, the serial flash slave onto the SBUS. Um, I think I, I, think I uh, lodged a GitHub issue for that one. Anyway. Uh, and then we added, obviously, all our custom IP as well, and then we had a, a mixed signal radio chip. Really easy to do. Uh, even, even the JTAG stuff is easy to kind of hack and add your extra own tap there to do things. So that's really nice. As I said, I think it paid off well. Um, I was going to give this talk about six months ago at ORConf, and at the time, like, we were very frustrated with Chisel, but... <laughs> Thankfully, <laughs> we've, uh, we've uh, kicked a lot of goals recently. So uh, I think overall, probably it was the right decision. We've been extremely productive in Chisel. Uh, all of the FI, all of the digital FI, so the Baturbi and everything, all written in Chisel, uh, just by one or two people, actually, even. So that was kind of impressive. And I th yeah, well, I'll, I'll talk more about, about that in a minute. but. Um, what we ended up doing, what, so you, if, again, if you're not familiar with Rocket, you can add custom instructions very easily. And our approach was to add the accelerators in a way in which they were accessible through a custom instruction. So you execute an instruction, you, you know, basically give the accelerator commands, like what, what uh, operation you want it to do. And then you would kind of sit there and wait for the, for the accelerator to finish and, and return to you. Um, and that's nice because as accelerators have uh, direct access to, to the, the data memory, the tight, tightly coupled data memory, so you know your packet data or whatever is going to be in there. You set it off, it goes in DMAs out of the little data memory, does the processing, sticks the result back there. Um, but, uh, actually this is not really what's on this slide, but, but the problem you have is that you can't make that, um, you can't basically do that in parallel because those accelerators block. Um, the accelerators don't necessarily block, but what happens is because it's an instruction, you have a destination register for the result, and then you launch it, and then you do another instruction which you know wants to look at that destination register, pipeline spots a hazard, and then and then stalls until the the result from the coprocessor comes back to you. So that's not ideal if you have a bunch of coprocessors attached to a single processor because you can only do one at a time. That's what, that's what we found out. Um, so yeah, we've we've converted to having uh, the peripherals, uh, the the accelerators as peripherals instead of uh, custom instructions. But I also think there's some cons in that as well. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, with with Chisel, I think that yeah, as I said, it was a nice language to have because it does remove a lot of the the kind of like um, monotonous overhead that you have to deal with in Verilog. Uh, the code base does remain relatively neat, I think compared to if you were writing in Verilog. And um, yeah, this diplomacy stuff. So to have a memory mapped peripheral, it's actually, I'm, I'm being a bit unfair there. It is, the, the code looks pretty noisy, but it's, it's not too bad at the, at the end of the day. Um, and for those, again, uh, if you're not familiar with the way that Chisel works and the way the rocket ship is set up, uh, it's just basically a whole set of different configurations. and you, when you're building, you know, you could potentially build a design and, and write no code that's going to be synthesized into gates. You could just sit there and, and play with the configurations. And, um, and you have quite a wide range of configurability in, in the rocket ship. And it makes, I, I kind of understand now why Sci 5 used Chisel. And, uh, you know, if you, ha if you were dealing with basically a bunch of different chips that were, uh, you know, um, Chips that had different configuration, right? A family of chips that have different, you know, cache sizes, peripherals, features, whatnot. 
it's really, really easy to uh, kind of manage that with Chisel. And yeah, and it works too, like, like <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so here's where I complain about Chisel. What, 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 hang on, my, my slides are going to be, okay. So if anyone's used it, you will notice that it's not quick. It runs, so Chisel is a language embedded in Scala which runs on the Java on a Java virtual machine runtime, right? It uses up truckloads of memory and is not quick. So it's kind of annoying when you just change one line and there's no like incremental rebuild feature. Uh, you have to just sit there and wait for it to do another big bang compile. Uh, before you get the Verilog that then you then throw into your simulator to elaborate. You know, that does get a bit annoying. Um, and there's not really much you can do about it. I was at the pub last night with Jack and I understand there might be uh, a solution to this and there's no coincidence that he's talking after me, actually, the, the, the guy who maintains Chisel because he can, he can respond um, <laughs> to all of my complaints. But yeah, there's not much you can do about that. Uh, and then also, uh, it, it just downloads tons of stuff. So for every new checkout of our code, um, the, I think the Chisel environment well, the, the Scala environment has to has to initialize and download a bunch of stuff from Maven.org, and that's not good. Like, it, like you don't want your your EDA tools to be downloading stuff from a random open source repository. You know, every time you do a clone, you should have ideally a local cache of that. Get that once, make sure it doesn't change. Because what happens when you get a part back in four years and no one's got a fresh checkout, and you go and try and do it, and then oh, this this version of this package is not available on Maven.org anymore. You're screwed, right? Um, and yeah, what if, what if, if, you, if, your, if your internal network doesn't have internet access to begin with, right? Like there's, it's basically a non-starter then. Um, yeah, so having a local cache of these files would be great. And actually, it sounds like that's what they're going to be able to do, so that's cool. Uh, yeah, deciphering the error messages that you get from the chisel build tool um, <laughs> are also, that's, that's like a, a full-time job, basically. And then... Um, <laughs> And then just little things with the language, like it's still being developed and you know you find little inconsistencies here and there, but uh, that's cool. They're, what I will now go on to talk about is um, the, bottom, the bottom point here is that uh, the community, the development guys are very, very uh, responsive and open and you know you go on a Stack Overflow, you do a GitHub issue, uh, th th they respond, so that's good. Uh, the other benefits are that the Verilog you get out is basically bulletproof, it goes into every tool we haven't found a bug in it. Uh, it's it's really impressive. It's and you know it's kind of commercial grade. So yeah, people are building real products in the real world based on on the rocket um, and and chisel. Uh, and you also get a bunch of other handy stuff which you sort of would have had to have done manually otherwise. So you get all your registers, for instance. So the, the reason why we're doing all of our registers in chisel is because you had all this really handy JSON out and like a device tree descriptor, so you get all of the memory map there and all the register definitions, bit widths, uh, uh, sorry, descriptions, and then you can convert that into whatever you want. So if you want to go and then generate HTML from that, or we actually generate all of our software headers for the software guys, so there's no magic numbers in the software. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. O obviously, that's what you should be doing. It's nice that uh, the chisel flow makes it really easy to do. And as I mentioned before, if you want to have multiple configurations of, of the same code base, they make that really easy as well. I think that's one of the major uh, USPs of Chisel. So, and if I were, so they're the nice points, but back to things we kind of want fixed in Chisel. Uh, I think that when you're writing and then something just disappears magically and you have no idea what caused that, or you're trying to add something and it just won't, it just won't appear. Uh, I think, I'm not sure if it's the Chisel or the Fertile Pass that, that uh, is quite aggressive at optimizing things away. So there will be stuff in your code, like actually there's, there's loads of stuff in the chisel which is optional and then there's just no trace of it whatsoever in the Verilog net list that you get out. And then it's kind of hard to figure out what you have to do to enable that sometimes. Uh, so more visibility into what the optimizing stage is doing would be, would be really handy. Um, we're trying to add in dual ports, uh, dual port ASIC memories at the moment. At the moment there's a lot of uh, like flip flops that go into the asynchronous queues that it uses and uh, that would be nice to be able to use a memory for that and then, yeah, we're also trying to, one of our things needs a dual port ASIC memory and I don't know, for some reason we can't get that working. Uh, diplomacy, I don't really know that much about diplomacy to be honest with you. I know what it's doing and it's, and it's very clever. It basically, 
before it generates any code, it negotiates, negotiates between all of the kind of like bus elements in the chip to say, I'm a master, I'm this wide, I'm this protocol. I need to talk to this bus. And then it goes around the design and figures out what everything is, and then based on that, it then generates the, the hardware. And that's really clever, but it's a bit opaque. It's very hard to understand how to use it well. And we, it's just a lot of trial and error fast <laughs> to, do, to do a lot of that. Um, so yeah, maybe more documentation on that would be good. Uh, uh, yeah, and then, oh yeah, why are asynchronous reset flip-flops so, <laughs> so hard to get instantiated? It's like a, you have to do like an individual module instantiation for those things. Um, and you know, uh, there's a couple of other things like hierarchical clock gating. So you want to stick in a clock gate for an entire block, for instance. Uh, I, I don't quite know how to do that yet. That's something we're going to need to sort out. Anyway, there are things in there that we would we need to figure out how to do, and there are things in there that we would like to use. But I think it's definitely been uh, like a productivity accelerator for us to, to for us to use Chisel. And of course, the Rocket IP just works. It's it's been really good. Uh, yeah. So. That's my talk so far, um, but I do have a bonus slide, which, because I think I'm, oh, I'm about on time, actually. No, no, I won't talk about this. That's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave a bit of time for questions. We're recruiting at the moment uh, as well, so if anyone wants to go in there and have a look at jobs. If anyone wants to live in Sydney, it's very nice. It's like this most of the year. Um, <laughs> feel free. But I'll, yeah, I'll take some questions now, if you like. Um, uh, can you describe some of the main features of the rocket uh, rocket chip and ro rocket uh, soft IP and its advantages? Sure. So it is like uh, in order, kind of like on a three or four stage pipeline, integer only, uh, like risk five CPU, and seems relatively mature. And uh, the, the the rocket chip is actually a full a fully featured SOC, right? So there's peripherals. There's loads of stuff in there that we don't need. Like I think it's basically designed to work with the DDR controller. We're a deeply embedded, like, you know, single chip solution. We won't have DDR. So it was really easy to remove all of that. But it's there if you want it. It's actually extremely configurable. And I'm definitely not the best guy in the room to be explaining what's in Rocket. There are <laughs> there are guys from Berkeley here who wrote it. So uh, I hope I'm doing a good job. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's just like a, a pretty standard like deep, like Im embedded class, RISC-V core. So it's a SOC, not a CPU. Uh, it is both. Like the rocket core is the CPU, but then rocket chip, I guess, is is the SOC. Yeah, and we're yeah we're using the SOC paired back or paired down and customized. Yeah, and uh, in fact, we haven't customized the CPU at all. The the CPU is fine as is. Yeah. Hi, I have a few questions about. Um uh, your your flow. Mm. Um, are you simulating, and if you simulate at the Verilog level, do you have good back annotation so you can understand things that are happening at Chisel? And also, do you oh. prototype and, and uh, verify on an FPGA? We do. So that's a good question. The first question is, how do you know what's going on in the Chisel when you simulate the Verilog? So Chisel will generate a fertile netlist, and then, and then the fertile tool which is actually really good. Um, it'd be nice. I hope Jack talks a bit about Fertile, but uh, that's, that's a really powerful thing. But that then generates a Verilog netlist. And most of the variables that you have in the chisel are sort of there, more or less. So you have a Verilog, kind of looks like a netlist that you get out of the chisel flow, and then we instantiate that inside our Verilog top level. And then when you're simulating in a Verilog simulator, yeah, you can just kind of see the variables there. Uh, you lose a lot of the intermediate signals, I find. But if you just name a signal something and you know you want to look at it in simulation, then then it more or less yeah is visible. And then yeah, we do emulate on uh, FPGAs. Actually, that's one of the points I made about the netlist being bulletproof. You can give that thing to well, because I think they they one of the targets is Verilator, right? So they they use Verilator to to make a cycle accurate simulation of the rocket chip. And Verilator is a really good tool, but I think its parser is very strict and probably one of the strictest out there. In fact, if, like, it's even a pretty good lint tool. If you don't have a lint tool, just if, it, if it compiles in Verilator, it's pretty clean. And so, yeah, the netlist just goes into any FPGA tool. Uh, actually, we would like to bring up the Verilator model um, for various reasons as well. So uh, 
that's going to be handy. But yeah, we, we do use FPGAs and there's no problems at all with, with the chisel design. Because it's like pretty much a single clock domain digital design, right? It's, it's pretty, pretty um, foolproof. Oh, sorry, sorry. And into the mic, please. Sorry. Yeah. As a follow-on to the verification question, how much time did you spend generating your tests and your vectors? Did you just run your application? Does Rocket come with a suite? Rocket comes with its own verification suite, but I think it's very specific to certain configurations. I don't know if we're running it for our particular configuration. I think probably it won't work with the way that we've modified Rocket. Uh, but yeah, we do tons of verification. We mainly run the C code on the various, yeah, yeah, kind of roll our own, I guess, yeah. Uh, I think you stole my thunder. I, I was going to ask you a little bit about your, your uh, verification environment and what sort of things you, uh, you know, do to verify your, your design. Yeah. Uh, we assume Rocket just works, right? And so we really only test the bits that we've modified and our accelerators, obviously. Um, I don't know, like, the digital, that part of the digital is definitely not the highest risk stuff in the chip, right? It's a mixed signal thing. We want to test all the interfaces to the analog. We want to test all the custom IP that we wrote. Uh, yeah, it's... So do you have sort of separate test benches for your own IP then that you run separately before you enter? No, like, we don't really do block level. Thankfully, it's all... More like we do for certain blocks we've written, but most of the, the testing, the chip is small enough, which is really nice. It's small enough that we can just run it. You know, we can run a full regression in a couple of hours, uh, which tests most things, and um, and then yeah, we do a bunch of AMS sims as well with the, with the radio model. Um, yeah, it's it's n definitely not state of the art verification, but you know we're a twenty person startup. <laughs> uh, we do what we can. I think we're doing a, a pretty good job considering actually like. Uh, yeah, and FPGA verification is actually very, very useful. Yeah. Uh, are there any sort of coverage tools that uh, tell you how good a job you're doing? I ran them just the other week, actually. Uh, yeah, no, actually, we're getting surprisingly decent coverage, like, I don't know, 90% uh, ish kind of toggle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in some blocks, in some blocks. <laughs> in the blocks we care about, yeah. Last question. Yep, cool. Uh, so I guess following on, continuing to harp on this uh, verification thing. <laughs> um, so I, I, I guess kind of my question is, how configurable is the Rocket uh, core? And so are you worried about cross products of configurations that they haven't tested of, I don't know how many configuration parameters there are for the core? That's a good question. I'm not, actually, I, we're not changing any of the, the Rockets, like, integer pipeline behavior. Like, we're not changing the width, we're not changing pipeline stages. Um, it's a little bit of a worry. Like, like, we, as I said, we ripped out the entire instruction bus interface, and we're interfacing that to our own bit of logic. But I don't know, I just kind of reverse engineered the bus protocol, and all works fine so far. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, definitely there's a risk that we misconfigure it. And, you know, we catch that quite quickly in simulations, actually. When we do break it, uh, it just, nothing happens. And then we have to go and, you know, root cause that. Do they offer formal or, or anything? I know that there's been a kind of a bunch of open source formal tools recently. <sighs> no. <laughs> uh, I haven't used them. I don't even know if they would run on a rocket. But, again, you know, we're placing quite a, a high level of, um, you know, confidence in, in the rocket IP. It's been taped out before. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm pretty confident that our batch of simulations and all the testing that we do with the kind of like, basically the, the real firmware that will run on the chip, we can simulate that, which is really nice. Um, yeah, so, and again, 20 person startup, there's only like four people on the digital team. And, uh, yeah, I, I think we're doing a pretty good job considering. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Well, well, we'll find out when the chip comes back. <laughs> <laughs> <I know. laughs> cool. Thank you. Cheers.